Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, second program. Glad to have all of you folks back. You've had your coffee break. And for those of you joining us out in your living rooms or wherever, we're just going to continue right on where we left off in the last half hour. In fact, all four programs this afternoon will probably just run together. I'm not going to try and uh, end in a particular place. And if we uh, end up in a middle of a verse at the end of the program, we'll just pick it up in the next half hour. So be aware of that this afternoon. All right, we're talking about the next great event on God's calendar after the rapture of the church will be the seven years of tribulation, the vex and ra va the vexation and wrath of God predominantly on the nation of Israel as we showed in the first half hour. But uh, I decided to just stop for a second and establish again from Paul's writings why I so adamantly stand on the fact that we will not go into the tribulation. We will not find out who the Antichrist is. That will not be revealed until after we're gone. And of course, the primary scripture for that is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I think most of you in the studio, I've already given that to you. For those of you out on television, join us then, if you will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to start right at verse 1. And remember, we're going to establish why I teach that this will take place before the Antichrist is revealed. All right, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren. So Paul is talking to his Gentile believers. Now, you know, it's amazing what these anti-Paul people can dream up. Somebody had given this guy one of my tapes delineating Paul's apostleship. And he came back with a series of questions that the guy should send me. And uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Well, one of the tenets that I had held to in that particular tape was that Paul alone was the foundation or the founder of the body of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where he says, I am the master builder. I have laid the foundation, which is Jesus Christ crucified. And so this guy comes back and he says, well, that only applied to the congregation at Corinth. He was the master builder of the church at Corinth. Now, I haven't answered it yet. I may not. I don't know. But listen, if that be the case, then when he wrote to the Romans that we are joint heirs with Christ, then that would mean just the church of Rome? When Paul writes to the Galatians that you're not under law, you're under grace, oh, that was just for the Galatians, that's not for us. See how ridiculous their arguments get? It just is nonsensical, but they'll dream up anything to refute what Paul has said. But here again, Paul is beseeching then these Gentile believers up at Thessaloniki, I guess the way they pronounce it in the ancient times, what we call Thessalonica. But he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Now, all you have to do is be a sixth grade mentality and look at that. Does that say I'm coming to the Mount of Olives? No. He's going to gather us to himself, as he had explained in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so there's no way that you can put this in line with the second coming when he comes and stands on the Mount of Olives after all the horrors of everything. All right, now then, evidently, people who were trying to upset Paul's teaching and his Gentile believers had come in and told these Thessalonian believers that they were already in the tribulation, that uh, there was no such thing as a rapture taking place until after the tribulation and so forth. So this is why Paul is saying what he's saying. He said, I beseech you, brethren, concerning these things and are being brought up into meeting the Lord in the air. All right, now verse 2, that you be not soon shaken. See, mentally, don't get all upset by what these false teachers are telling you. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither in spirit nor by word. In other words, don't let these guys come in and fast talk you into thinking that you've missed something and that you're out in left field. No, nor by a letter 
as from us. What does that imply? They were actually forging letters and sending them into his churches and signing Paul's name to it. I mean, the devil will stop at nothing. And so that's what they were doing. And so the Thessalonians, now you've got to always remember, always remember, what kind of people were Paul's converts? Well, they'd just come out of paganism. They knew nothing of the Old Testament. They knew nothing of Israel's law and Israel's God. They were just simply brought out by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of this Jesus of Nazareth, and God had transformed their lives and had given them the Holy Spirit wherever they were able to withstand all the pressures of persecution and everything. But you see, they didn't have a lot of theology behind them. They were still babes in Christ, and so these false letters would come in, and you can understand, it would throw a curve at them, see? And so Paul is almost frantically writing to them, don't believe this stuff, see? And don't you take a forged letter as from me, and don't you believe for a minute that the day of the Lord is at hand, because it couldn't be at hand until they were raptured, as he had taught in 1 Thessalonians, see? All right, now then verse 3 is the one I want to spend just a couple more minutes on. So he says, let no man deceive you. Don't you let someone come in and say, well, you're in the tribulation and uh, there's no such thing as being called out ahead of it. You're going to go through the horrors of all the prophetic things. So he said, don't let anyone deceive you by any means for that day. Well, what day? The day of the Lord. And what's the day of the Lord in Scripture? The seven years, see? That day, the tribulation, shall not come unless there come first a departure. Now, I've had Jerry put these men's name on the board, and I want you to lock this in this afternoon like nothing. I've used them before, but I haven't put them on the board. These are the first five translations of the original manuscripts from the Greek. Total? Is it gone? Narrow and back? Okay. Tyndale, 1534. A year later, Coverdale. And he's the one that I have quoted on the program over and over. Coverdale, way back here in the 1500s, said, Always determine who wrote it, to whom is it written, what were the circumstances, what went before, what follows after. That was this guy. And he translated the whole Bible from Greek to English in 1535. The next one was the Geneva Bible, which, of course, was over in Switzerland. And that was in 1537. Then came the next one, the Cranmer Vital Bible, which was in 1539. And then several years after those four were completed, we had the Beza, and I'm not as acquainted with this one, in 1565. But these four basic translations from, English, uh, from Greek to English, all within a matter of one, two, three, four years. Now, when the King James came along then in 1611, the 1611 translators used Tyndale's almost word for word and these other three as well. So all of these early translations were agreed on this verse that it should have been translated depart instead of fall away. Now that's the point I want to make. Why the King James came in and used the word falling away, I'll never know, but it's still seems, means basically the same thing. But now read it in that light. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day the tribulation cannot come except there come a departure first. And that word departure is used 11 times, if I'm not mistaken, by Luke in his gospel, in the book of Acts, and in Paul's epistles. Eleven times, it's always translated to depart from one place to another. All right, so the departure here, as we've taught before, this is review. This departure, then, is the body of Christ removed from one place to another, from earth 
to heaven. See? All right. So unless there is a departure first, then can that man of sin be revealed, who, of course, is the son of perdition. And then Paul goes on and explains that individual, much like Daniel does back in chapter 11. So I want to make the point that here we come to the end of this dispensation of the grace of God, the outcalling of the body of Christ, and we have to be taken out first before the man of sin can be revealed to bring in those final seven years. Okay, that's enough on that for now. Now let's come back and sort of pick up where we left off in that first half hour, and let's establish that from more portions of Scripture, it isn't just Daniel who speaks of those final seven years. Come all the way back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Now we're just going to establish this period of seven years so that you can't say, well, you're just using one verse back there in Daniel and so forth. No, all of Scripture alludes to a seven-year period. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 11, and uh, come down to verse 2. The court which is without the temple, leave out us with regard to that tribulation temple, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city, Jerusalem, they shall tread underfoot forty-two months. How long is forty-two months? Well, that's three and a half years. This is the second three and a half, see? And we're going to go look at the first three and a half in a minute. All right, so here we have three and a half years. All right, now verse 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, or speak forth, a thousand two hundred and sixty days. How long is twelve hundred sixty days? Forty-two months. How long is forty-two months? Three and a half years. See how all these numbers fit? All right, now then come on over to chapter 12, verse 6. Now we're speaking of the escaping remnant, which we're going to be looking at. But I'm just establishing now, and I hope I'm making sense, that this seven years cannot start until the church departs. But once it starts, it's seven years. It's 1,260 days, 42 months. Another 1,260 days, 42 months for a total of seven years. All right, now in chapter 12, verse 6. And the woman, Israel, the remnant, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they, the Godhead, should feed her there a thousand two hundred and sixty days. Twelve hundred sixty days is what? Forty-two months. Forty-two months is three and a half years. All right? And then you come on down again to verse 14, still then chapter 12. And to the woman, this escaping remnant of Israel, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, one year, plus times two for a total of three and a half from the face of the serpent. And so we have this over and over throughout Scripture that we have a seven-year period of time. All right, now come back with me, and we'll go to the Lord Jesus himself. And in my goodness, if you can't believe him, then you are in tough shape. If you can't believe the Prince of Glory, if you can't believe the Creator of the universe, well, then, I don't know, you might as well fold it up and forget about it. But Matthew 24, which I have maintained for 30-some years, is all tribulation. It's all prophecy concerning these final seven years. All right, since we're in it anyway, I'm going to bring you down to verse 14, because this all fits. Since Israel is going to be the core of all this activity, Jerusalem, and the temple is going to be rebuilt, the 144,000 Jews are going to be commissioned to go out and take salvation to the end of the earth. What gospel are they going to be preaching? You know, there again, I had a letter a while back. 
I don't know if these people hear me repeat their letters or not. So be it. But he wrote and he said, Les, I don't want to go in the rapture. I want to stay here and witness and see people saved. Why, the poor fellow, doesn't he know? He's going to be ashes before he even gets his mouth open. And the gospel of grace won't be valid. It wouldn't do him any good to go out and preach our gospel because it's not going to be under the gospel of grace. The Lord himself, here it is now, the Lord Jesus himself, if you've got a red edition, it's in red. Verse 14. And he says, this gospel of the kingdom. In other words, that which he and the twelve were preaching. And what was the gospel of the kingdom? That Jesus Christ was the promised Messiah. And he's going to bring in a kingdom. See? That's what's going to be preached. Well, now, isn't that logical? Seven years from now, here he's going to come back and stand on the Mount of Olives. He's going to set up his kingdom. And in will come the thousand years. Well, isn't that good news? Well, sure it is. And so that's the good news of the kingdom. That's what he preached in his first advent. And that's why he used the word this. See? And this gospel that he and the twelve were preaching at the time... This gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of the grace of God that Paul preached, that we teach, but the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So it's not going to be confined to Israel. It's going to go into every tongue and tribe and nation so that there will be candidates for the kingdom from every nation on earth to reestablish the population. See? All right, so they're going to preach it in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. How's the end going to come? His second coming. And he's going to come and stand on the Mount of Olives, and the uh, horrors of what we saw in our last taping will have been consummated, and the earth will be made ready then as the Garden of Eden. All right, but now getting back <coughs> to our seven-year time frame, now go on into verse 15. Verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, that's the Antichrist, when he goes into the temple in the middle of the tribulation, as Daniel said in chapter 9, that he will go in and he will cause it to be defiled, and it will remain that way then until the seven years are ended. Jesus is referring to it, see? When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and you see that individual stand in the holy place, in the temple, remember? Whoso readeth, let him understand. Or right, then let them who be in Judea flee to the mountain. Now we'll cover that in, in a later program. I don't want to do that just at this point in time. But see, here we have then the establishment of a seven-year period of time. That's exactly like we've got it on the board. Three and a half years, three and a half years, and that, of course, will be ended with his second coming, and he'll bring in the kingdom. So now, whenever I teach Revelation, you've heard me say it before, the easiest way to understand these final seven years and all the events is to take the events at the opening, in the midpoint, and at the end and then fill in the details. All right, so we're going to concentrate this afternoon now on the opening events of this final seven years of time as we know it. And that, of course, would have to be the appearance of the man Antichrist. All right, turn with me now, then, if you will, to Revelation chapter 6. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 6. And we're not going to stay there very long. Just for a little bit in chapter 1, and then we're going to have to chase down some information. Revelation chapter 6. All got it? And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now lock that word in. A seal. Just like when you seal a letter. Or well, I always immediately think of the revenue stamps at the courthouse. You stick those revenue stamps on. It designates an official act, doesn't it? All right, now that's what this is. We're going to look at it in just a minute. And so when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four creatures said, Come and see. 
And I saw, and behold, a what? A white horse. Not the white horse of Christ at his second coming in chapter 19, but a counterfeit. And who is the master counterfeit in Revelation? The Antichrist under satanic power. So this is the appearance then of the Antichrist, which will open that seven-year period of time. It can't open until he is revealed, because he is going to unlock the seven years and this first seal on this scroll. All right, now then we better go back, and we've done it before. A lot of this is review, of course. Just back up a page to chapter 5. What kind of a seal are we talking about? Well, it's a scroll. And that scroll was sealed, much like we would an envelope, but instead of with just the lap and the glue, it was sealed with seven seals, so that it wouldn't unroll. All right? Revelation chapter 5. Now, I love teaching this. I can't help it. I just think it is so, it is so vivid. It's just such a beautiful picture. Verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Who's on the throne? God the Father or God the Son? Well, God the Father. God the Son isn't sitting on a throne. He's at the right hand. All right, so here we have a picture then of God the Father on the throne, and he has a scroll, a rolled up, written within, on the inside where nobody could read it, but also on the outside, and then sealed with seven seals. Now, can you picture that? That shouldn't be too difficult. Here you've got a, a, a papyrus laid out, and they write out all the details of a what? Mortgage. Yeah, I like to read lips. A mortgage. What kind of a mortgage? Satan. Well, when did Satan get the mortgage on planet Earth? Wow, here we go. Genesis. <laughs> now, isn't this fun? It better be. Otherwise, I might as well go home. Genesis. Chapter 1. Drop in at verse 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Now, I know we've done all this before, but some of it is probably 17 years ago. <laughs> Are there? Genesis 1, verse 28. And God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have what? Dominion. Now, I think most people think that was over the Garden of Eden. No. How much dominion did he have? Everything in God's creation. See? It was all under Adam and Eve's control. They were given total Dominion. That's what it says. See? Replenish the earth and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every living thing that liveth upon the earth. See? That was the realm of their dominion. Oh, but what happened? Come over to chapter 3. Verse 6. Now, I know this is all old hat to you, but it, it still bears repeating. Chapter 3, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the one that the Lord said, Thou shalt not eat of it, remember? <coughs> and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also unto her husband Adam, and he did eat, and then suddenly the eyes of them both were opened. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves and so on and so forth. All right. What happened? Adam dropped the ball. Right? In a simple act of disobedience, he dropped the ball. Now when he dropped the ball, what did he lose? Dominion. 
He was no longer in control. He was now under the curse. But oh my goodness, beloved, who picked up the ball? Satan did. And he's been running for a touchdown ever since. See? Now you think I'm kidding? Now I'll jump back up to the New Testament. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 4. Verse 3 and 4. That cannot be. Two minutes? <laughs> I'm just getting started. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom, that is, in the lost of this world, the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should... who is the God of this world? Satan. Since when? Since he picked up the ball that Adam dropped. Now come back with me to Matthew. Matthew. Chapter 4, verse 8. Now I hope you're having as much fun as I am. <laughs> you know, one of the best seminars I ever did, I was sick as a dog out in Indianapolis all day, but I tell you what, I told those people, I am sick as a dog, but I'm having fun. Because when you get this book opening up and how it all fits, now, I'm sure you've all worked a jigsaw puzzle. And then all of a sudden, a whole bunch fall in place. My, it gets exciting, doesn't it? Well, same way here. All right, we've got to do it quickly. 40 seconds. Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the devil, Satan, takes Jesus up into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. That is, from stem to stern, all of them. And the glory of them, and he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, how do I always put it? Were all the kingdoms of this world his to give? Yes. Yes. But what did God know? Not really. Not really. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.